I'm Chrissy Lim. I'm an Immunology Research Fellow at the Agency for Science, Technology and Research in Singapore, ASTAR. Overall, my goal is to understand how the immune response works. So this involves looking at cells with lasers, with multiple dyes, looking at microscopes and culturing them to see what they do in response to infectious diseases. There's been a lot of concern with the knowledge that most drugs and vaccines will take 10 years to be developed. And this is indeed true for past drugs and vaccines, but a lot of that process is actually application for grant money, application for approval to proceed with the phase trials, and then getting rejected for the grant money, which happens to 90% of grants that get submitted. The thing about uh, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 is that there was an international effort to band together knowing it was a pandemic and it would affect a lot of people's livelihoods and health and just shortcut all those processes. All right, here's a quick walkthrough of how the RNA vaccine works against COVID-19. And to be more specific, this form of RNA is mRNA or messenger RNA, and it's so named because it carries a message in the cell to make a certain protein. So here in this case, what has been manufactured is simply a short strand of mRNA that encodes the spike protein that is found on the surface of SARS-CoV-2. So your cell, when your cell gets the injection of the COVID-19 vaccine, it starts making the spike protein by getting this messenger from the RNA that then degrades within a few hours or a day. It's very short-lived, but it's enough to make the spike protein that gets picked up by various parts of the immune response. And this goes through a cascade of several different types of immune cells, for example, dendritic cells, T cells, and B cells. The important thing here is that at each step, um, one cell that makes the spike protein can activate multiple dendritic cells that then talk to multiple T cells, and in the end, talk to multiple B cells. And B cells are where I would like you to pay attention because these are the very active, basically, antibody factories that will make your antibodies that recognize the spike protein. This brief reaction is enough to trigger a response over the next one or two weeks, make these antibodies and generate something really important called immune memory. So the body actually stores the information from the spike protein and stores these B cells that make these antibodies against spike protein for several years in an effective vaccine. And during this period of several years, if you are exposed to a real SARS-CoV-2 infection, the SARS-CoV-2 virus has spike protein on its surface, the immune system picks it up, recognizes it from the first time it got it from the vaccine, and the antibodies are ready to go. You no longer need to go through this one or two week wait period. And that is why the vaccine is protective, but doesn't give you disease because it doesn't actually have the virus. One of the very common myths about the RNA vaccines is that it's a form of genetic manipulation. It's going to get into our cells and change our DNA, the genes, and therefore it's very scary. Um, that is not going to happen. So there are several reasons for this. One of which is that DNA makes RNA in the, normal, in the body for, um, for any protein that you make in the body, for example, insulin or albumin. However, it doesn't go the other way naturally. It is actually just a one-way process. There are a couple of exceptions to this that I will acknowledge, where RNA can become a form of DNA, and that is with the addition of enzymes called reverse transcriptase and integrase. So reverse transcriptase is an enzyme made by certain viruses that converts RNA to DNA, and I think this is the source of concern where people know that this can happen. However, this is only made in certain viruses, and SARS-CoV-2 is not one of them. Another thing is that you will also need additional signals on your RNA before it can actually be inserted into DNA. So you have several steps that are actually blocking the conversion of RNA into DNA that happens in, a natural, in, in any natural setting. The last thing is that the RNA is going to degrade within hours to days. So it's not going to stay in your body for very long. So the risk is actually really low of it causing any further side effects. The trials only began about half a year ago 
and so we have data for up to about six months. Side effects for such vaccines usually only happen within the first week or so of the dose, and therefore if we don't see anything severe within the first week, it is very unlikely that you'll only see something coming up in three months or six months. The most common ones were having a sore arm, being very tired, having a headache, but they all faded within one or two days after the dose. And this is actually also what you see with other common vaccines. None of this is actually new and we don't expect something to come up in the long term. However, the trials are being monitored for two years and will eventually be a report of any long-term effects that come up in those two years. At the moment, the general conclusion is that the vaccine should still work for the new strains that have come up. And in fact, all this immune response target multiple parts of the spike protein, not just one side. It will likely take multiple mutants for the vaccine to be completely ineffective against the spike protein. The nice thing about the RNA vaccines is that they are really easy to change the sequence off to reflect any small changes in the spike protein. So they can be easily updated compared to the old technology vaccines. This immune response is consistent throughout the human race, thankfully, and this has applied to all the vaccines as well. But that said about the trials, even though the main sites were in the US and in Europe, as well as South Africa, there has been an effort by the trial committees to make sure that this includes a diverse population as much as possible. So that would include Asian Americans, African Americans, of different age groups, uh, different cities, different geographical regions. So they have tried to account within the data directly for all these different racial groups. What I can say is that the trials have made a huge effort to include recipients who are up to 75 years old and above, in part because COVID-19 is such a dangerous disease, especially for older individuals, we know that there is a high death rate in this group. And luckily, their safety profile is exactly the same as it is for anyone below 55 years of age. So yes, the vaccine is safe and accounted for in older individuals, and they should get vaccinated if they have access to it. The trial has excluded explicitly immunocompromised individuals, such as those with active HIV in infection, or perhaps on immunosuppressive chemotherapy, so unfortunately, the data is lacking in these particular patient groups and they will need to probably rely on herd immunity for a while. Unfortunately, the guidance on pregnant and lactating individuals is a bit more fuzzy. There is absolutely no reason to suspect that any of this technology or the spike protein will cause any changes to fertility or pregnancy or breastfeeding between the parent and the child. However, there hasn't been specific data for this particular group and therefore many governments are exercising an abundance of caution for pregnant and breastfeeding women to perhaps avoid the vaccine for now, but to not be denied if they decide to pursue it after counselling. Herd immunity occurs uh, against an infectious disease when enough people in the general population are immune to an infectious disease such that there is a prevention of transmission because the virus simply just cannot get a foothold on any on enough humans to spread effectively. When I talk about herd immunity protecting these uh, immunocompromised individuals or pregnant people who may hold off the vaccine, I mean that the people, for example, their spouses, their family members, their colleagues, all being vaccinated so that those colleagues and those people around have an immunity to the virus and therefore cannot actually spread it to someone even though that someone in the middle is not vaccinated. All right, the really last important note. If you're vaccinated, it's not time to burn your mask. Dobby is not a free elf. Please do not run away. Firstly, the vaccine will actually take about one to two weeks to generate the requisite antibodies. You are still at risk of exposure and getting infected the normal way just because it takes that long to make your antibodies. And secondly, not everyone has gotten the vaccine yet. Although the vaccine is definitely known to reduce the severity of disease, we still don't have a good hold on how much it reduces transmission. So you could be carrying the virus. It might not be causing you disease, but you might still pass on some level of it unknown to the next person who is at risk. So we'll need to keep masking up, social distancing. I'm sorry it's all boring, but you are saving someone's life and you may not know it. Let us know if you have any comments, thoughts or questions in the comments below. Thank you.
Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for your regular dose of Asian health information.